Hi, Professor Valerian Ventura. I hope you are well today. I've heard that you are a lover of powerful cars and would like to give us an insight about some of the technologies that are really in vogue these days. Is that right? Good morning, Alessandro, and good morning to all my fellow students. Alessandro, yes, you are right. I really like powerful, roaring cars. And before you start with your boring and very technical lecture, I will give my fellow colleagues a five minutes introduction to what they will learn. Design, security, drivability, and performance are only some of the areas in which modern cars have seen tremendous improvement. These are all surely interesting, but we will not touch on every aspect of engine development. Instead, our focus will be only the most interesting of them all, as some may swear by it, the turbocharging. Wow, that sounds exciting. Please keep going. Many among us may not know exactly how a turbocharger works, apart from the fact that it boosts engine power. In reality, an engine can be seen like our lungs, in constant need of ingesting air for the 21% of oxygen it contains. Assuming you are leisurely strolling down Orchard Road, you will not notice the fact you are breathing, because the demand for air is less. This is similar to an engine without any boosting, which are called naturally aspirated. Contrarily, if you are running in one of the Singapore marathons, you will be gasping for air, and at some point realize that breathing can't cope with demand. This is what happened in a naturally aspirated engine running at high speed or high load. Now imagine how blissfully it will be if you can have a compressor tank to support your breathing. This is exactly what a turbocharger does to an engine. It compresses and supplies more air than it would be possible by just natural aspiration. In an engine, more air means more fuel can be burned, thus increased power. Professor Ventura, very interesting indeed. However, I remember my grandpa driving a car using turbochargers. So what's so exciting about that? Turbocharger is in fact an established technology, which was introduced more than a century ago by Swiss mechanical engineer Mr. Alfred Bucci who filed the first patent application in 1896. Since then, turbocharger development has gone through waves of military and commercial applications. First mass production of turbochargers was in early 1900s, when General Electric tested it in airplane engines. In 1940s, Turbo engines spread out during the Second World War in most fighters and bombers. In the automotive sector, it was not until 1860s that turbochargers were a commercial application. Chevrolet released the Chevrolet Corvair Monza Spider, which was soon withdrawn from sale due to its poor performance and reliability. This hiccup did not prevent further development. And in the 1980s, turbochargers were widely used in passenger vehicles and most sport cars, including Formula One. However, turbochargers were banned from Formula One in the late 80s, and even its application in passenger vehicles slowed down dramatically through the 90s. The table turns around from early 2000 when OEMs showed increasing interest for turbochargers. But not for conventional reasons as one would expect. If engine powder has been the mantra for turbo development during the 1980s, fuel economy and emissions are the new keywords in most turbocharged vehicle development since the 2000s. Wow, I have to say, I am impressed. But please, help me to understand better 
turbochargers is a technology for fuel saving or for making my engine more powerful. It sounds a little bit confusing to me, and I guess to the audience here as well. Turbochargers can be defined as exhaust energy recovery systems or boosting engine technology. These two definitions are two sides of the same coin. Let's see why. The core turbocharger system is represented by two wheels, turbine and compressor, connected together via a shaft. The turbine and compressor wheels are themselves housed inside two flow connectors, which has look alike, which serve the purpose of both accelerating and provide guidance to the flow. In fact, the exhaust gas leaving the engine is accelerated in the turbine housing before passing through the turbine wheel. Hence, the energy belonging to the exhaust gas is transferred to the turbine wheel, which in turn starts spinning. This is similar to a windmill stake that many of us played with in our childhood. Exhaust gas spins the turbine wheel in a similar manner that wind turns our colourful windmill. As a consequence of the turbine wheel rotation, the compressor wheel will also rotate at the same speed. Because they are on the same shaft, as the compressor wheel rotates, fresh air from the ambient is drawn inside its shell-like body, vacuum cleaner sort of effect which compresses the air to a higher pressure. Air leaving the compressor wheel is then squeezed into the engine. From this description, it is apparent that the energy recovery aspect of turbochargers is given by the energy transfer occurring between the exhaust gas and the turbine wheel, whereas the boosting aspect is given by the compressor wheel forcing more air into the engine. Oh, now I understand. But please, help me clarify one more doubt. How does turbocharging relate to engine performance? What happens within the engine if we use turbos? Now, in order to fully comprehend the benefits of turbochargers, we need to take a quick look at engines and how they work. We all know that burning requires oxygen, and this is available in the atmospheric air. Similarly, fuel in an engine requires an infinite mass of air in order to achieve and sustain combustion. The relation between the amount of fuel and air in an engine is called the air to fuel ratio. In an internal combustion engine, the air to fuel ratio is fixed and it is a design parameter of the engine itself. In addition to this, engine power is directly proportional to the amount of fuel being burnt. Hence, by squeezing more air into an engine, more fuel can be burned, and therefore one would obtain more power output than it would be possible with an equivalent non-turbocharged engine. This is exactly the purpose behind Mr. Bucci's concept. However, nowadays, we are in some ways obsessed with environmental impact and save the planet for our children in the future. So the question of relevancy is if a turbocharger can increase an engine's power, why not make the engine smaller and in the process reduce the fuel consumption and emission? Would you not be happy if your engine can produce similar power? but now it is smaller and gets you an additional day or two of fuel driving around Singapore. Surely you would, and this is a sentiment of major engine developments in the past decades and many more years to come. Hence, OEM's trend is that of producing smaller engines, still capable of adequate engine power, but with one or more turbocharging systems, enabling to recover as much as possible out of the exhaust and hence mitigate fuel consumption. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Prof Ventura. What should we expect for the next lecture? We have just described what is an engine turbocharging, 
and what are relevant for today. But there is still one question to be answered. We can even hear the questions from all you turbo devotees. Why the turbocharged cars take a few seconds to accelerate when you step on the pedal? Some of you may know the answer, but for others, this is called turbo lag. This will be explained in the next month's section, together with more interesting aspects of turbocharging technology. Stay tuned.